and every now and then I get something a bit peculiar and they say analytics we've been doing that for 25 years or this is uh, this this is nothing new so really what I'm going to talk about in the next uh, 30 minutes or so is, is some of the research uh, that I'm doing as an analyst and a consultant um, that's describing what uh, what's emerging within the, within the analytics uh, space so a little bit about uh, ARC. So ARC, we like to think that we're a research, a unique uh, research company where our roots start in uh, automation or operational te technology. Generally speaking, the people that come to work for ARC, they're all senior people in industry. We've got economists that work uh, for the uh, for the company. The um, uh, we've got uh, folks that come from pulp and paper, chemicals, pharmaceutical, many different uh, industries. And, and the other thing about the company is that we're in actually 10 or 11 different uh, regions around the world. So the main office is, uh, is set up in uh, Boston, Massachusetts in the in USA. And we've got presidents in uh, Germany, Europe, Canada, France, Japan. So it gives us a different perspective of actually what's uh, what's happening around the world in terms of uh, best practices, emerging practices, and uh, and technologies. And the company came uh, came to be in about 1986. They they actually got their start uh, doing uh, market studies for things like um, control valves and distributed control systems and real time control systems that are running many of the plants today. And now they're very focused on. Uh, a lot of the uh, the IT uh, type technologies that are used uh, in a manufacturing facility. So I, what I really want to talk about is digital transformation. Um, you know, oftentimes we uh, we use bud buzzwords like um, uh, industrial Internet of Things or Industry 4.0. There's many words that uh, are common today uh, amongst uh, our industry, and really what it comes down to is we think that there's a lot of things that are different today than there was yesterday and um, ultimately some of it is because computing is getting cheaper and organizations are getting better at uh, deploying technologies and it's getting easier to get solutions to the market in order to solve different uh, operational or engineering problems but really one of the things that we've noticed and this is the the focus for today's meeting is the process industries have a tough time because they they have difficulties understanding where they have operational risk. They have difficulty understanding handover of information on capital projects. They have difficulty um, uh, assembling the data that's in the many disparate systems that are spread throughout a um, a uh, plant or a or a facility. So much of this data today exists in process historians or uh, or um, uh, time series databases. So much of this data is not actually uh, used uh, today. It's um, uh, short for short-term purposes, and there are some tools that I'm going to talk about that focus specifically on the time series data. But basically, uh, most of this data is archived and left for some future undefined purpose. We, we also know that capturing the knowledge of what's in the workers um, and the people that understand uh, process facilities is really hard to get. And we know that uh, the erosion of the workforce is something that is very real as the baby boomers um, exit the workforce. So with all of that, um, there's a new technology that we're seeing called machine learning. And I'm going to explain what machine learning is uh, as it as it relates to um, as it relates to process analytics. And ultimately, I'm going to talk about some of the outcomes that we're seeing across the uh, process industries in terms of how machine learning and analytics technologies can actually help um, predict what's happening with your process and uh, with the uh, assets that are moving your your process. So one of the things that we notice about process analytics is if we look at business analytics, it's not, the, the way we would describe this is not vastly different. So business analytics gives you the ability, and this is where, you know, the original BI tool started as tools that were, that were present to help uh, financial departments uh, 
be better at forecasting. You know, this would be for a supply chain, or be for uh, forecasting projects or forecasting costs. But generally speaking, the the emergence of business intelligence and analytics has helped companies answer questions, not just what's happened or what's happening, but think about more of what will happen, when will it happen, and what can I do about it. So these these questions have been answered for several years within the business intelligence uh, and business analytics market. But what we're seeing now is, is that the analytics technologies and tools are those, those structures and processes are moving closer to the plant. So when you look at this from a plant perspective in thinking about uh, how to operate, uh, how to properly maintain, now the disciplines that are in a, a refinery or a chemical plant or a pulp and paper facility, they're asking the same questions where they They've always had the ability to 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 know, to know what's happened, or generally that can be answered very quickly. But some of the other questions about the process, about uh, why is this actually happening, what will happen, when will it happen, and what can I do about it, that's been very difficult to answer when looking at um, uh, process historian uh, type data. So if I look at the last decade or two of deployment of process information, you know we've had our usual reports through crystal reporting or some other some other tool. So it's easy for us to generate these on a on a shift basis or a, on a, a daily basis or a weekly or monthly, whatever whatever makes sense. And we we walk into facilities and we see dashboards on the screen or the TV, and these generally can can uh, are really good at displaying key performance indicators or trends. So so that you know what's happening when you when you visit a facility. So in terms of what's happening, um, enterprise manufacturing intelligence solutions have been good at this, and it does take some work to aggregate information so that you can produce a, a dashboard or or some type of, a, of an overview of a, of a facility. But why is this happening? It takes a little bit longer. So at ARC, we've actually divided up the the uh, process analytical spectrum into a few different buckets. And we describe the KPIs and the reports as more the descriptive analytics. But when you get into why is it is it happening, these are what we call diagnostic analytics and when you start thinking about um, um, cross-functional context across different uh, disciplines in a facility um, and answering questions about what will happen in the future and when will it happen this is where we get into what we would say is the predictive analytics uh, market or even the prescriptive because ultimately it's, it's one thing to know why something is happening because you've gone and you've looked at the operator logs or you've looked at the the trend tool you've done an analysis analysis in Excel or something like that but actually being able to predict the future is something that takes many many hours if not weeks to figure to figure out so we see this this um, uh, emergence of machine learning algorithms being applied to cross uh, being applied to the process data which is making it easier for companies to think about when things will happen and this is from a a process perspective in terms of um, whether or not there's an anticipation of a change in a batch or a change in a grade or you may anticipate tower flooding or something else or have a distillation process in a refinery but ultimately what we see happening is is the tools mainly driven by machine learning algorithms and new technologies it's the tools are actually getting much better at uh, helping um, uh, oper helping operators and engineers know what they can do about it so in terms of what are the use cases that we see in the industry we see process variability so optimization and advanced process control have been good at this but we also see an application for predictive analytics to be able to look ahead and see see what's, what's happening so operators or engineers can make changes uh, manually. But uh, companies are justifying this in terms of maintaining production and energy um, and avoiding process trips. We see uh, applications for this uh, predictive analytics and process quality and avoiding reruns and avoiding waste and um, making sure there's no customer impact. But as we, we see this also not just about 
process, but we also see it about asset health and predicting the behavior of assets so that assets are performing as expected to move the process. And ultimately, this is uh, there's huge benefits for operators in being able to predict um, incidents and avoid un un uh, planned downtime or worker safety. Uh, many of you may have heard of the Abnormal Situation Management Consortium. This is a group that um, Honeywell does a lot of work uh, with us now. Honeywell is an automation solution provider. But um, essentially, th this, this is a well-known statistic. So the ASM group is there focused on identifying challenges and factors associated with process operations. And they're looking at things like improvements to the operator interface and safety systems and control systems. But generally speaking, the sources of statistics that they call out are, out of all the incidents impacting the process industries, 42% of those are caused by people and 36% are caused by equipment and 22% is caused by the process. And that box is a little bit small there. But um, when we look at that, we think that there's a little bit more information that can be uh, derived if you study that actually deeper. So we look at it as, as although ASM statistics would say the process is 22%, we think that the process is actually probably a little bit higher than that. Because if you look at equipment and assets, that do they really fail? Are they really responsible for 36% of the process up, upsets or, or slowdowns? Or is the asset failing because of, uh, of what's called, what we call process abuse or operating the asset incorrectly? So we think that if operators and engineers had better ability to predict the process, right, then perhaps maybe the process uh, could, could actually be lessened and they could, it could improve uh, process availability. And we think it's also important that is the 42% accurate for causes of uh, shutdowns or slowdowns because do we give the operators and the engineers the, the right tools? So we think that machine learning will actually shift the some of the statistics in terms of, of what's happening to cause a plant slowdown or, or shutdown. So we have, a, we have a lot of tools today and I mentioned this uh, in one of the first slides. We talk about this thing called infrastructure. So the, the primary tool that has been used in a, in a process facility is the process historian. Uh, what, what do we know about this? We know that it's, it's a proprietary database and um, there's over a dozen different suppliers of, uh, of a process historian out there. These are really good at uh, collecting data and many uh, suppliers of, of process historians have done a fabulous job at making these, um, these devices able to talk to many different uh, assets and systems, DCSs and PLCs. So they're really good at collecting data and they're really good at writing data, but they're not, they're not good for things like search. So in terms of finding particular events and correlating this with other information, this is really tough. Um, many suppliers have done a great job of integrating these with EMI solutions and creating the dashboards, which I spoke about earlier, and certainly standards like OPC have been instrumental in making this uh, easy. But we know that um, many companies also, they use, they use short-term data and they, they apply some of their process analytical tools in this area, but most companies don't make use of archives. Um, we think that there are more rear view looking and the majority of the work that's done is, is in Excel. So the Excel is probably got most of the white space here. That is, that is the main tool that most engineers would use to be able to figure out process uh, performance. So what about this thing called machine learning? I just want to talk a little bit about that. Um, what I recommend is if you're really interested in learning more about machine learning, we have other information available in more studies, but we, we basically see that this is computer science that's involving from pattern recognition and computational learning, or, or else we also call this artificial intelligence. And the goal of this technology is to mimic the human mind behind your behavior. So taking things that are repetitive in nature, taking them away from human, um, applying algorithms for abstract thinking and learning from past experience. Um, we also know that machine learning is closely related to data mining and statistics. So basically, artificial intelligence is a method of teaching computers to make predictions about some data. Um, 
we know that it's using this this term big data, which is usually applied in the process space to um, lots of different data sets and predictive algorithms. And there's lots of uh, machine learning algorithms that are available in, in open source as well. There's a couple of different um, types of machine learning that are important for process data. These are both supervised and unsupervised. And um, basically, the, the, this will apply a little bit to process data. I'm, I'm going to talk about it a little bit in terms of things like looking for patterns. And, and this is done through both um, uh, operator input or engineer input defining this uh, event through process trend and unsupervised, which is also the use of algorithms to identify this uh, on the behalf of, um, of uh, the human. So <clears throat> one of the things that we, uh, we know for sure is it's hard to get context from operator or engineer. Everybody that's in a process facility has their job, whether you're in environmental or you're in safety or you're in maintenance or operations or engineering. We've all got our own data. We've all got our own frame of reference, but it's very difficult to contextualize that. And the way that it has been done is we tend to take the streaming data and we contextualize that in uh, EMI platforms or other dashboarding uh, type tools, but it's still hard to apply that context, right? So one of the things that we think is, is also important is getting this context uh, from the operator or engineer or other discipline in a facility and applying this in an area where it makes sense. So you can do that at the dashboard and, and I certainly think that there are there are reasons why you will you will always use dashboards, but there's also a reason to, to make this context uh, at the source of the data where it's actually being collected at, and this is at the infrastructure uh, level. The, um, there's often uh, there's, there's talk about this new emerging role called the data scientist. And especially in the enterprise space and the Internet of, Net of Things, and as soon as you start talking about big data, enterprise solutions, they, they, they first, uh, they'll start to talk about this concept of a data scientist. One of the, one of the things that we've noted is, is a data scientist is not a normal role that's in the process industry. So we're, I'm going to talk about a couple different ways to apply machine learning algorithms, and one is to apply it at the source using a data scientist to the other is at the, uh, at the uh, enterprise uh, level. Um, data quality, uh, many of you that work with historian tools, you know that data quality is really important in terms of making sure that uh, you understand gaps in data and you've got appropriate um, uh, uh, data compression rates and ultimately when uh, you have a trend that's at a, at a certain um, that has a certain pattern, you can understand that uh, that, that uh, trend is the way that it is because of maintenance or because of some other factor. So we, we think that it's going to be really important uh, going forward in industry to make sure we get this context correctly from the operator or engineer at the place where it makes sense. We also know that uh, knowledge capture can't be completed by training alone. And many of the studies that are that are out there point to 30% of the industrial workforce retiring. So we know that um, there's a lot of knowledge that's embedded in the minds of the operators and engineers that are operating plants. Uh, and this is either through um, operations that are that uh, spend time going outside, or the operators that spend time at operating consoles in front of a distributed control system. So the one way of capturing intelligence is to build uh, training programs and modules and learning management systems and building the, you can also build that into a simulator both 3D or, or 2D so there's certainly lots of reasons why you'll continue to train operators that way but by taking the tools at the at the uh, process information or historian level and embedding information at that level is another way that uh, can uh, can be a little bit more efficient and I'll talk about that. So what we're seeing in the market is is the this emergence of this analytics platform and there's a couple of different ways that we're seeing it seeing it go. One is the next gen 
digital cloud platform and an example of one of these uh, solutions might be the GE Predix example where you build a data lake, you've got your app enablement, you've got a, a bolt-on mobile platform, it could, could have a social. You probably need a data scientist or two in order to make it work and generally speaking you've got to start building building on an enterprise platform. The, the other way to do it, which is what we're also seeing, is the what we call the try and buy type solutions. So this the argument for best in breed versus ERP, which was predominant for the, the last few decades, is still alive and well, even in the analytics space. So the other side of, uh, of analytic solutions is we're seeing an emergence of of uh, these try and buy solutions that, that bolt on to existing historian infrastructure and um, re-index the data, so to speak, because the databases are hard to get at and proprietary. And um, these projects den generally, um, they, they compete with the full stack solutions or long projects. So they're also, we're also seeing very specific analytic solutions as opposed to generic ones. So we're, there's a couple of different ways that, uh, that we think this market's going to move forward. I mean, one could be the small bolt-on on-premise solution, or I guess it could be cloud as well, or the, the next-gen the next gen IoT uh, type platform. So we also know that, you know, getting back to data, getting holistic insights is difficult to get. Um, we know that there's many different systems of record to try and tap into, whether it be operator logs or the engineer uh, that's responsible for uh, quality of a particular batch is probably doing a workup of, um, of a scenario in Excel, and that's hard to share that data. Um, we know that um, there's information in the operating rounds and the many different databases. So generally, when, when it comes to answering analytics types questions, um, for example, what's happening, why, why is it happening, when will it happen, and what will I do about it? Answering those questions today uh, is, takes weeks. So generally speaking, the, the rule of thumb that we, that we hear is, is it's about 10% of the time is generating the report, and 90% of the time it's just gathering the data from all the different uh, sources. Um, back to uh, business intelligence and d dashboards, you know, these are all, IT heavy, so the challenge is, is for manufacturing operations is they tend to not have IT experts uh, on, on staff, or at least they have IT experts, but they're more infrastructure focused and they're not available to um, support these types of applications. Um, offline spreadsheets, these things are everywhere. So Excel is probably the one of the biggest enemies and friends in the process industries because one, it's easy to get going for operators to take uh, process information data back to Excel, but it's also really hard to share use this uh, in, uh, in other for other applications, and it takes too long to make the decisions. Um, from a maintenance perspective, this is probably kind of important because uh, we think uh, machine learning and analytics technologies applies to process and to physical assets. And from the predicting the process is one side, but predicting asset failures is usually in a, a different discipline. So on the top here in the blue boxes, the the old way to do this is you take a single variable like a vibration or another vibration or XY plot, and you're looking at the streaming data, which says this is the condition of this machine, and you generate a workflow, maybe you've got an automatic work request, you alert the engineer or operator, and what the, what the uh, uh, predominant um, outcome of this is, has been is a high degree of false positive, or basically operators tend to lack uh, they don't trust the system, and it also generates a, a reactive maintenance philosophy. So that's that's uh, another way to describe this would be condition condition based monitoring. So the emergence of analytics for machines this this is where we think is is different is is because machine lear learning is able to look at multiple variables, and you're not just looking at the streaming data of a particular point off um, an asset, in this case the one on the screen, I've got a, an axial compressor or a, uh, a turbine, part of a jet engine, but they're also looking at the time series uh, history uh, as well. <clears throat> when you apply machine learning or 
we also call this precise pattern recognition. When you apply that using unsupervised and uns or supervised learning, the what we see is is also same workflows, same work re uh, work requests can be in place, and same alerts the operator and engineer. But we see a significant reduction in the uh, the false positives. So what that tends to do is it builds more trust in the system. You've got more days notice of failure of process or of, uh, of asset and it lends itself to more of a predictive maintenance uh, philosophy. Um, because we're an analyst firm we like to do a lot of surveys and we like to talk to a lot of customers. Um, this is a recent uh, uh, research initiative we did on the industrial Internet of Things. Another one of these buzzwords on disruptive uh, technologies. But in this case we we asked um, we asked our clients about the business drivers for analytics and outcomes they were looking to have solved. And the number one uh, things that they were looking for is ultimately is they want better process performance and they want to reduce asset uh, downtime. So in terms of use case of process analytics, this is probably the number one and the, and the number two. Another reason for uh, what's driving this is the maintenance uh, maintenance perspective. So we we find that um, especially with the oil and gas industries, uh, oil prices uh, the way that they are today, uh, companies are um, forced to make uh, concessions and figure out better ways to operate and maintain and reduce cost. So more and more companies are looking for ways to try and move away from corrective or break fix maintenance and away from preventative or scheduled, which uh, both of these types of maintenance uh, approaches are costly, to more predictive. Um, so, so, that, so from the full spectrum of the types of things that uh, that you might do or the approaches you might use to maintain, predictive and prescriptive we see as the um, the lowest cost, the fewest amount of false positives, and the uh, and the most trust by the the operator. So companies that are starting to leverage these uh, these new tools for predictive analytics or prescriptive analytics are starting to reduce cost. Having said that, um, in 2015, the um, still the number one method of approaching maintenance is to use preventative uh, maintenance uh, technique techniques or or corrective. Uh, this is some study data where we've looked at uh, a UAL study from 1968. The U.S. Navy did one in, in 1982, and uh, other companies as even as as, as uh, early as 2001. There's lots of studies out there that look at um, age-related uh, failures and random failures. And, and the interesting thing about all of this data is it shows that random failures are only 82%. But what this study doesn't address is that it doesn't address how the assets are actually operated. And I think that's one of the biggest problems. And even uh, meantime before failure of assets, it works really well for the test bench, but it doesn't work in process operations. So one of the things that we're seeing for uh, uh, predictive and prescriptive analytics is the ability to actually uh, add um, accuracy to MD or meantime before failures for a facility or a plant. And back to, um, I'm using a pump example for, for an asset. We, we see the convergence of both process and discrete from the, from the perspective of, um, of the physical asset. And oftentimes because we, we, give, um, we give our uh, reliability technicians or our operators tools that are fit for purpose for them, they don't often get an opportunity to look outside of their particular assets. So you might have a maintenance person that he sees um, the temperature of the windings of the motor, he sees the thrust, the vibration, maybe they might see the discharge pressure off of a, off of a piece of pump, and they try and do re re reliability and predict the health of that pump to support a, a given process. But the reliability people aren't looking at what's happening upstream or downstream because that's outside of their discipline. And the same goes for an operator where an operator who is operating the, that pump in terms of its on off and speed to control flow, they see the process and they don't see, they don't see the asset. So one of the things about 
predictive analytics or, uh, or prescriptive analytics is these tools are able to pull the data from both machine and process in a way that provides the context they need to predict the failures. And um, the other thing that we would notice is that uh, as much as I'm an advocate for predictive or prescriptive analytics, for changing the, the the process, we know that it doesn't always make sense to apply this this technology across all assets or across all process. The um, sometimes it makes perfect sense to operate an asset and break fix and not worry about spending the time to make it um, to to predict when it might fail. This is a this is an example. It's an excerpt from Dow Chemical, and Dow presented in a in a session that I was hosting at the uh, ARC Advisory Group forum in 2014 on process optimization. And from Dow's point of view, they they would agree uh, ARC would agree with Dow, and that there is no there is no one tool for satisfying all of the needs of process or assets. So Dow would say that statistical process control and multivariate quality and online analytics and soft sensors, advanced process control, these are all things that are important to make sure that your process is optimized and you're looking after quality and uptime, et cetera. But it's the, it's the addition of process analytics or, um, or uh, maintenance analytics or predictive analytics that would make, that would enhance the capabilities of those, of those group, groups. So this was in 2014 when um, it was actually uh, Lloyd Cogrove uh, who did this presentation. It was a great presentation. Um, you know, going forward, I think we're going to see uh, predictive analytics or um, prescriptive analytics in the, in the onset of machine learning in process. We're going to start seeing that a lot in a lot more presentations from companies that are uh, solving uh, uh, process or maintenance uh, outcomes. And Hans, that's, uh, that's all I have to present uh, today. Thank you. Um, I, I like how, it, by the second part of your presentation, we, you, you've actually acknowledged the fact that although we're focusing a lot on, on assets today, it, it's not necessarily what is going to impact the process as such, right? And it's a, and it's a challenge to to bring those two together. Uh, we we hope, uh, of course, as a, a strand miner, to be able to be part of that. I do have a couple more slides uh, myself here. Uh, how we um, how how we actually feel we fit in um, in in this market. Uh, so on the left of, of your screen, you see the how much a solution is process industry integrated. And on the right, you see how generic the technology as such is. When we look at what the DCS historian and MES, and we call them the full stack vendors, are delivering today from a value perspective, they are very good at DCS connectivity, data historization, and, and, and data structuring. Once you start looking into the analytics, those technologies are usually not that strong, and they'll they'll rely on third-party technologies to help them out there. If you look at the third-party technologies that are starting to emerge into uh, advanced analytics, you'll see um, a lot of generic technologies, uh, Microsoft, IBM, SAP. They are mostly coming from a business intelligence perspective. They are asset ba uh, modeling-based asset uh, monitoring. We see a couple of solutions there, but bridging the gap between the process industry integration and the generic technology is is usually quite expensive in time, resources, and infrastructure that is just not there today. So it, it usually takes a lot of time when you get such a solution to making it integrated into your plant. Um, and you'll need extra people to do that. Um, so at Trendminer, we try to um, start from within the process industry. The founders of our company actually were people that were uh, process engineers themselves and, and said, you know what, we need to do more with this data. So we, that, we didn't really start as a company as in, well, we know a lot about analytics. Let's see what we can do for the produce, process industry. We did the other way around, and we started from within the industry itself and, and then starting adding more value into the analytics. And you'll see us doing more of that on our roadmap, going more and more into uh, a stronger analytics platform. Uh, but a lot of that is, is focused on the, um, on the users that are currently uh, 
available and working in the, in the industry. And I've I've made another graph on this one to explain how how these solutions usually are done. So we have our process and engineer here on the right, and he has a lot of questions about the data that is hidden in his uh, the information that is hidden in his data and the historian. And the first thing we we, we did, or and, and you've actually mentioned it a couple of times, is that we hired a data scientist, right? And we asked the data scientist, well, we've got all these numbers here, time series over years and years. Um, how Which technologies do you know that you can apply here to find anomalies in the numbers, to find uh, abnormal behavior. So the data scientist looks at all the technologies available, and then he started building a solution for the engineer. So that's generically what's been done today. Even, even if you find uh, a solution that is already integrated into our industry, let's say in, uh, what is it, Tableau, Click, Mtal, name them uh, all the ones that are out there today. Those technologies still have a pretty large ramp up time before they're actually valuable uh, for the engineer themselves. And still, every time the engineer has a new question, he has to go back to that data scientist to build him a new model. Um, and it takes a lot of time to actually building and training those models. So that's the classic solution, how it's been done today. At Trendminer, we wanted to take the other way around. So we, because we, we're, we're coming from the industry ourselves, we looked at the process engineer and asking what are the tools he's actually using. And he said, and when we look at the tool the process engineer is actually using, he's using a trending client. So what we've done at Trendminer is that we've built a new and modern trending client. And then we've said, you know what, all those analytic issues that you want to build it into that, that's our problem. Um, so we don't feel that in order to solve those questions for the process engineer, he should be asking those questions to yet another person who's just not there today. Because quite, frank, quite frankly, those thousands of data scientists you want for the, for the process industry, I'm not seeing them. They're just not there. Um, so we'll have, to, we'll have to do it ourselves. So how does this look like? I, I'm, I'm not going to go through the, pre, to, uh, through the application. So I just used uh, one example here of a screenshot. And you'll, you'll recognize that this is a trending client, but it is a modern version. It's not a retrofitted Windows application. It's actually built for the web. It's built to be uh, flexible and agile. Um, as a company, we've, we also, I, I like that you, you mentioned uh, the quick wins and, and how you can, um, instead of having those big uh, solutions that cost years to build and maintain, it may make sense to add smaller solutions like a trend miner that that bring value immediately. Um, and this is this goes back uh, in trend miner into our DNA of how we want to be different as a company. We want to build, bring value fast, um, and we want to bring that value from within the customer itself. So our tagline at the company is joint innovation. Joint innovation means that we as, a, we as a software company, we acknowledge that we do not own the truth in ourselves. The truth is in the experience of the user and within other people within the industry. So joint innovation has six pillars of which half of it is customer oriented. Um, what we, what we want to say here is that we want to be as close as possible to the customer. Um, we have a very transparent communication with our customers. We're bringing new uh, releases every two, three months. Um, I'm not sure our customers have seen that before from inter enterprise solutions. And another thing I, I want to focus here is that lowest barrier of communication, which is a third pillar of our customer-oriented um, side of joint innovation, is we want to capture as much as possible information from our customers, which means that we've even added um, tags, uh, chat support in our application. So instead of starting a new uh, support ticket on a hidden website with 78 logins, uh, we've just built chat support within the application. We've even built feature requests within the application so you wouldn't have to go send an email. Um, and this is all, we want to lower that barrier and just to make sure that we capture as much as possible of that information, we can already say that we have built we've had, we've built new features in the technology that were requested less than two or three months before we've actually released them to the customers. So that's how we want to be fast um, in that innovation trajectory. On those on the on the right side, we also want to acknowledge that 
we have a bunch of very smart uh, engineers, but we're we're only a team of 20 to 50 people, and we're not going to build the most generic technology that works for every single customer if we don't listen to other parts of the community and the open source community to learn from other technologies that have been built with thousands and thousands of people. And we also do a lot of research um, with uh, long long term projects with the universities and with customers. So this is a little bit how we want to be different as a company as such. Um, and I, I don't really want to take too much more time here. Is there anything you uh, you actually want to talk about as well um, while we are here? I'm not seeing questions popping up in, in the questions panel. If there are people on still online that want to ask a question, please do so now. Um, if not, uh, we'll, we'll be happy to take your questions afterwards. You've got uh, mine and Peter's email address here um, on the screen. And uh, Peter, I, wanted, uh, I definitely want to thank you for the, for the time that you've taken for this, uh, this webinar and, and, and the chats. Oh, a simple question. Will you share the video recording of this? Yes, we will, uh, Simon. So um, I've, I've recorded the session. And it should be up uh, online in in the next few days. But everyone that was in the present, uh, that was here, uh, or was signed up and was not here, will get an email from me with a recording. Um, Peter, do you have any closing statements? No, I don't, uh, Hans. I certainly appreciate the opportunity to come and present uh, with your with your community. And uh, for those attending the session, um, like Hans says, uh, my email is on the screen. If you have any questions about something that I didn't make uh, clear in the presentation, uh, please follow up with me, and I'd be I'd be happy to explain in further detail. Okay. Um, well, if we do not have any more questions coming in right now, I thank everyone for their time, and. Drop us a mail or say, give us your feedback. Bye-bye.